In order to copy the magic of the original, Avatar The Way of Water copies the way it handled world building in the first movie. It introduces us to a bunch of characteristics of a brand new environment through the lens of how natives coexist with their surroundings and how humans have developed cool technology. It worked once, it should work again. On paper, it's a sound argument, but the problem with Way of Water is that unlike the original, we're pretty much every additional world building element was used to serve the narrative in some way, almost as if they added something only when it helped and made sense to the story. Avatar 2 does it just to make the world of the story seem big, i.e. just to copy the superficial effect of the original, regardless of what the cause is. The first negative consequence of this is that the story will set up cool looking elements that never get meaningfully paid off, or it'll pay off elements that aren't properly set up because it would help the plot. As far as unpaid off setups go, when the Sky People come back and they say that they're there to terraform Pandora because Earth is now too far gone, that seems really important. The Sky People are coming here to stay, and they're paving over forests to do so. We even get a new sort of villain to represent that new cause, with an introduction incorporating a new fighting style with a new technology. Which is pretty cool! And then it's thrown away! The terraforming lady doesn't come back in a meaningful way, even as the equivalent of a boss fight or anything. Even though some random fisherman and Jemaine Clement do. Even the literally world-changing subject of terraforming doesn't matter, it's just cool-looking, undeveloped background noise to make the world feel bigger. Kiri's epilepsy scene does the same thing. It's put in there to spice things up, and then disappears forever. It's not like she has to jack back in to get some answer from Ewa or her mother from the spirit realm at some point, but that she has to dive into water to save someone even though she knows she'll have a seizure. It just never impacts anyone again. One of the most shocking examples of this is the fact that they made the unobtainium mistake again. Unobtainium 2 is introduced as being a cure to aging that humans need to take from the whales but then it's never seen actually preventing aging. It's never even seen ever again. We never even see it at any point along the supply chain other than obtaining it. You could have done an obtainium again for that matter. It's possible that the juice is supposed to be a storytelling step up from the unobtainium because it has a specific quality instead of just being a valuable mineral. But the fact that it's that specific, and we don't ever see it paid off, ruins the point of that specificity. It's like the movie is trying to waste your time. Also, it's not like the specificity of anti-aging is naturally related to the whales, so it's also a stretch that isn't necessary. Regarding unset up payoffs, when the one lady's whale dies, we didn't know that whale belonged to that lady before it was killed. So not only are we supposed to feel bad for a whale that has nothing to do with our main characters, we also don't even get the sad emotional payoff for the side character that it belongs to. Also, we didn't know the whales had the capacity for language before we started talking to them. When you give information is important, not just what the information is. And oftentimes things happen to serve the story that are never explained at all, especially regarding Awa. When Kiri needs medical help and technology doesn't find anything helpful, but some random Awa ritual solves everything, it's never been established how this ritual works or why Kiri responds to it. It just wakes her up to get the story back on track. In the beginning, seed things indicate that Kiri is special, but that doesn't set up her powers, it just shows us that something is going on with her. That thing still needs to be answered for anything to make sense. Is she a messiah character who got her powers because of her connection to Ewa and mysterious birth? If so, how and why? There are too many questions the audience needs to at best make mental stretches about the Avatar world to accommodate for, or just ignore. As a result, she's just a superhero with a third act payoff because it would help the story if she were a superhero who could have a third act payoff. In Minority Report, we had to jump across the moving traffic created by the futuristic infrastructure to escape capture. The futuristic drugs impacted the plot. We had to get new eyes because of a facet of the future world that's used for advertising as well as tracking. The setup was entertaining, and the payoff helped the plot. That's also why the supernatural plants and the drug kids apparently telling the future feel a little out of nowhere, because we're paying them off without setting them up. In Star Wars, we had to navigate the sky highways through a chase after we saw it as something cool in the background on Coruscant. Single-use elements don't work because they're either a setup without a payoff that was just introduced because it looked cool, or a payoff without a setup that was introduced just because we needed it for the story. Meaningless entertainment, or out-of-nowhere utility. 
The second negative consequence is that adding things just for the sake of adding them can retroactively diminish the things that you put into the story that do matter. Or it can just straight up make things not make much sense anymore. Take the opening force destruction as the sky people make their return to Pandora. It's a good way to sum up the humans in a pretty effective reintroduction. Just the act of the sky people walking in the front door is devastating. It instantly slaughters thousands of creatures and makes the whole landing area uninhabitable. The problem with this is that the humans' effect on Pandora that we actually focus on in the movie isn't anywhere near this drastic. So the introduction is not only misleading because it sets up Darth Vader and then gives us Jabba the Hutt later, but it also detracts from the actual All's Lost moment for the tribe later in the story. Basically, the narrative is trying to tell us that the death of a single whale, who only matters to a character we don't even know it belongs to, and who's above human intelligence, is also, at this point, unknown to us, is more important than the eradication of an entire forest area and every creature within it. Narratively, maybe, but emotionally it falls flat. And I know that this is the tribal all is lost moment because well, let me hand you over to Retro Score for that one. Ah! Here's a hot take. To go a step further, even the fact that the humans just keep coming somewhat invalidates the end of the first movie. Well, the aliens went back to their dying world. If we were focusing on the terraforming aspect so that the human side of the story were different in practice, that would be one thing. That would be a meaningful addition that would play out differently. But since we don't, even despite how much sense it makes in the narrative, having that just happen again without making it new or next level to show that progress was made sort of just feels a little bit like a slap in the face. And that effect also carries forward, in that even if we defeat them in this movie, why couldn't they just do the same thing again? There's a similar thing with the reintroduction of Korch. Would it even matter if Korch lives or is lethally defeated again at the end of this movie? The humans could just make another one. They showed us that they have his memories, so even the main antagonist's quality is also diminished by his mere existence. He's a clone, he's disposable, he might be threatening, but defeating him doesn't in practicality carry much weight. This might be the reason Jim decided to keep him alive, for him to eventually come around and be defeated by means of being befriended. But those sequels don't even exist yet. I'm watching this movie. Mission Impossible 4 didn't revive the franchise in terms of quality and take the world by storm because it was building towards Mission Impossible 6. The franchise keeps pushing out top tier films that pay off prior movies and leave elements open to build towards future installments without sacrificing their individual quality. You don't have to do four hours of homework watching Guardians of the Galaxy 1 and 2 to understand and enjoy 3. The Infinity Saga of the MCU became the biggest thing on Earth in terms of movies because of this reason. Its films were almost always individually strong and simultaneously built to a head. You can do both. And you're expected to when your movie has the highest budget in Hollywood history, i.e. half a b b billion The quintessential example of additions that make things sort of nonsensical is the tall person suits, which is too bad because it feels like one of the only pieces of technology that naturally evolved from the first movie. As it stands, the tall person suits are usually a disadvantage compared to the war mechs from before. There's no reason to wear one on a ship designed for regular sized people, and the Na'vi kid can just kick one and it falls. And they're never seen winning a fight against a Na'vi, so they only have a real fighting advantage over humans. And the one thing they're never used to fight is... Why naturally evolve the technology just to make it worse? Look, all the Star Wars movies are about the same single family screwing up the whole galaxy for a reason. It's because that's the thing at the center of this universe that matters most. It's not like Episode 4 is about Luke helping Han square his debt with Jabba, while Chewie just mentions that a planet blew up yesterday and it turns out it's because there's this big laser moon piloted by an emo scuba diver. No. We're the ones seeing our home planet destroyed. We're the ones losing people we care about to the scuba diver. We're the ones who risk our lives to stop him and save the galaxy. Because in the context of the world we've built, that's more important than how much money some guy owes a big slug. That's the thing that carries the most weight. Let's say we chose to focus on the terraforming. The fact that the humans are coming back to stay and they're gonna destroy entire ecosystems 
and slaughter as many natives as they need in order to do it. Because that's the biggest thing happening in the world we've built, and it's a natural step in the grand narrative. Instead of replacing the nonsensical MacGuffin from the first movie with an even more nonsensical one that doesn't even need to exist, use your sequel as an opportunity to fix it. Maybe we find out in this movie that the reason the humans were there for the unobtainium in the first place was directly tied to the fact that their world was dying. Maybe unobtainium has some sort of innate property that makes terraforming possible. Canonically, unobtainium led to the formation of the Hallelujah Mountains, so it's not out of the realm of possibility. Maybe the reason they were there in the first place was because they needed the unobtainium to fix their dying planet. But now, because that effort of just coming, mining, and leaving failed in movie one, it's now too late and the Sky People have no choice but to abandon Earth and come and stay. And it's kind of Jake's fault because in the first movie he decided to side with the Na'vi instead of doing his job and explaining why they're there to try and mine peacefully. And Jake's revolution only showed that peaceful negotiations aren't an option because the natives have proven that they're violent. There can be no cohabitation, so the Sky People are taking more drastic measures. Just just by centering our story around what actually matters, a few narrative improvements happen automatically. Now the tall person suits and the animal mimicking technology symbolizes humans bastardizing elements of Pandora. Now the clones represent sky people invading and literally becoming a part of Pandora's animal kingdom. Now Korich's return embodies how Jake's actions in the first movie, regardless of his good intentions, forced the enemy threat to evolve into something even worse that's coming back to stay and is ready and able to strike even harder to do so. If the Avatar franchise is actually building towards something like this and Way of Water is just a stepping stone to get there, that's not an excuse. Planning ahead is one thing, but you can't sacrifice the quality of what is for the sake of what could be maybe one day. Just look at any major video game developer. As it stands, the main thing Way of Water offers is just a new environment. And you can't make carbon copies of the same story and put them in different settings with different superficial mechanics and expect it to be a compelling saga. That's not what sequels should be. If you want to explore new environments, you can, but you have to do it as the continuing step after the original that still honors and makes use of what we did and accomplished in the original. It can't be unconnected. It has to be natural. And the villain you choose for that world should be next level.